Do you know the dangers associated with heating your home? Carbon monoxide poisoning it is absolutely preventable. Don't burn anything in a fireplace that isn't vented. Don't heat your house with a gas oven. Don't use a generator, charcoal grill, or a camp stove inside your house. And if you're using it outside, make sure it's at least 20 feet from a window, door, or vent. My name is Brent Smith. Let's get connected. Today's weekend connection on the Bible Broadcasting Network could be called a weekend reconnection as we're continuing our conversation from last week's program with Susan McKelvey, the communications manager for the National Fire Protection Association. There's more to discuss concerning the importance of staying safe as we heat our homes during this winter that many in our country are still dealing with. Susan, let's begin by briefly reviewing some of last week's discussion. We learned some valuable information about using our home furnaces, both electric and gas. What did you say were some of the key things to remember about our central heating systems? Well, you really do want to make sure that all your central heating systems are in good working order. That means having it inspected and cleaned if necessary by a qualified professional. And we recommend that people do that before the start of each heating season. You just want to make sure that everything is in good working order. Obviously, if it's not that, then you run the risk of um, carbon monoxide or, um, you know, a, a fire hazard. Those are fire hazards associated with equipment that's not working properly as well. So it's just so important to make sure that your heating systems are in good working order. Okay, let's talk for a minute about carbon monoxide. I know it's been called sure. the silent killer. Why is that? So carbon monoxide, you can't taste it, smell it, see it, or hear it. So you don't know when it's in your home. There's no warning sign. Um, so it's real. that's why um, it's so incredibly important to have carbon monoxide detection in your home because there is no way to know that it's present. Um, you can take all these steps to minimize the likelihood of having carbon monoxide in your home, but the best thing to do is make sure you have proper um, detection. In other words, having carbon monoxide alarms in, alarms in your home to make sure that if there is a presence of carbon monoxide, you're alerted to it promptly and you can get out quickly and safely. Thank you for that, Susan. We really need to pay careful attention to our furnaces and not just take it for granted that they're operating as safely as they should. Our central heating systems, though, are not the only culprits when it comes to heating-related dangers. Sadly, there's an average of 70 deaths and 160 injuries each year related to the use of portable heaters, including electric space heaters, according to the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission. Susan, would you please refresh our memories as to what to keep in mind about portable heater safety? First of all, if you're buying a new space heater, you want to make sure that it's listed by an independent testing laboratory. They make sure that the appliance is tested to establish safety levels. It's also really helpful to have an automatic shutoff feature with portable heaters. So if they tip over, the heater will automatically turn off. In general, if you have one at home, you want to make sure that it's in good working order. Are the knobs working the way they should? Do they turn on and off? the way they're designed. You want to also make sure that the cords are in good working order, that they're attached firmly to the space heater, there aren't any cracks or frays in the wiring. Um, you just want to make sure that the equipment is working as it's designed to. You want to make sure that your space heater is at least three feet away from anything that can burn. So think of things like any furniture, if it's near a couch, drapery, blankets. It's really important to make sure that anything that can burn is at least three feet away. And you also want to be mindful for children and pets that might be in the room where the space heater is located. Make sure that someone is around to monitor the space heater and ensure that pets and children stay well away from it. Um, the other thing you want to be really careful about is you can use it when you're in the room, but make sure to turn it off when you leave the room or you go to sleep. And the other thing is never use a space heater in a bedroom when you're sleeping. Um, you really want to be monitoring space heaters carefully. We know from our data that space heater fires tend to happen when people aren't there to monitor them and something, or um, they're unattended and something comes in contact with them. So that, that's why that messaging is really important to follow. 
Well, that covers what we said last week about the two main choices for go-to heating sources for the home, central furnaces and portable heaters. But we should remember, of course, that portable heaters really aren't a viable choice as standalone heating for the home. There is a reason they're called space heaters, and that's because they're designed for taking the edge off of small spaces. The other primary heat source is something that not everyone has, and that's a fireplace or wood stove. We were discussing those last week when we ran out of time, and we will pick up there in just a moment. But one important thing we talked about on last week's Weekend Connection is the troubling trend among people who are more challenged in their income of heating their homes by turning on their oven and leaving the door open. Susan, you indicated last week that there are more dangers inherent in using a gas oven to heat a home than in using an electric oven, but that it's a dangerous thing to do no matter the type of oven. So if you would, remind us, please, what the dangers are of using an oven with the door open as a home heating appliance. It is not a safe idea. You can run the risk of, at the very least, someone getting burned if you're come in contact or near an oven. There's a risk of a fire hazard there, obviously, but also you can present carbon monoxide in the home or nitrogen oxide. So there's all these elements that can build up in your home that present all these safety risks to people. So it's never a good idea to use um, an oven to heat your home. That's not what they're designed for. Now, Susan, that's the second time carbon monoxide, the silent killer as it's called, has been mentioned in our conversation. I looked it up and any measurement of carbon monoxide more than five parts per million is considered unsafe. So it is very important for us to have carbon monoxide detectors in our homes to warn us when carbon monoxide levels rise to an unsafe level. And since we were speaking about using a gas oven as a heating appliance, there are regulations limiting kitchen ranges to producing no more than 800 parts per million of carbon monoxide every 12 hours. Now, that's a lot more than the 5 million parts per million that's considered a safe level. But 800 parts per million being produced by a gas oven within a 12-hour period is considered safe because no one is expected to normally run their unit for 12 hours at one time. But continued operation of a kitchen range producing that 800 parts per million in a tight house without extra ventilation is going to cause carbon monoxide levels to rise quickly to unacceptable levels. And so there is a lot of data warning people to not try to heat their home with their oven. You know, again, ovens are not designed to be heat sources. Regardless of the type of oven, oven should not be used as a heating source. Susan, you mentioned not only carbon monoxide, but nitrogen oxide. I was curious as to what the difference is between the two, and this is what I found in my research. Carbon monoxide displaces oxygen in the blood, and obviously we need oxygen to get to our brain, organs, everything in our bodies. If any part of our body is without oxygen for too long, it won't survive. Carbon monoxide works really quickly, so we need to be careful about exposure. Exposure to nitrogen oxides may result in changes of the pulmonary system, including pulmonary edema, pneumonitis, bronchitis, bronchiolitis, emphysema, and possibly blue baby syndrome. So those are two different types of dangers coming from misusing the same piece of equipment. It's always a good idea in practice to use appliances in the way that the manufacturer says to use them and to use them for their intended purpose. Again, we're speaking with Susan McKelvey, Communications Manager for the National Fire Protection Association, joining us today on Weekend Connection, where we're wrapping up the conversation we began on last week's program. Now, Susan, we were just beginning to talk about fireplace safety last week when we ran out of time. It sounded as though some of the guidelines for safely using any other heating source apply to fireplaces as well. For example, keeping them maintained and not placing things that can burn too close to the unit. Would you comment on that for us? Yeah, so you want to make sure, once again, like with any other type of heating um, equipment that you're using, that it's in good working order, um, that it's been cleaned 
as needed and inspected. Um, and then you want to make sure that you're only putting in fuel sources that are designed for a fireplace. Once again, you want to make sure that you're monitoring your fireplace carefully when it is in use, that you have a solid sturdy screen to, that could catch embers from um, flying out of the fireplace. You also want to make sure a lot of times people use a lot of decorations around their mantle, but you really want to be careful of that and make sure that you keep anything that can burn any type of combustible away from um, the fireplace. And then of course, once you're finished using it, make sure that um, the fire is completely out before leaving the room or your home or going to sleep. I'm going to take a moment to share a Christmas memory with all of us. When I was a child, my parents used to burn our used wrapping paper in the fireplace each Christmas so we could watch the different colors as the paper burned. But now I hear that paper printed with colored inks and dyes give off a dangerous amount of heat that's probably too high for what the fireplace is rated for. Is there any danger in burning that sort of paper in a fireplace? Um, you know, one of the things you have to really consider is that, first of all, burning um, wrapping paper is not good for the environment. It, the, um, the chemicals that are burned when uh, Christmas paper burns going into the air, it's not, it's not healthy for the environment. But it also can create what's called creosote, which is a byproduct of um, fuel sources that either don't burn fully or burn improperly. And Christmas wrapping paper is an example of that. So creosote can build up along the lining of the fireplace, uh, of the chimney, um, and it's highly flammable. So you, for many reasons, you don't want to be using anything in your fireplace that isn't designed to be in there. Wow, I really should have made myself aware of that a long time ago. Now, you said that we should only use fuel sources that are designed for use in a fireplace. I found out that there is actually a limit to the amount of heat to which the parts of a fireplace and chimney should be exposed. I've heard of people burning charcoal in their fireplaces, which burns so much hotter than seasoned firewood. We should never use treated or painted wood in our fireplace or shrubs with vines, toxic wood, plywood, or wood that has been used for making furniture, primarily because of any varnish or stain that may have been used and how that might burn. We should also never burn green wood, especially evergreen, because of the flammable sap that it contains. And that goes for Christmas trees, too, of course. Unseasoned pine is full of sap and will burn much too hot for the fireplace and chimney. And that chimney can be damaged if the temperature gets too high. And also burning unseasoned pine can contribute to creosote buildup in our chimneys. Do you have any other input for us as to what we should not use as fuel for our fireplaces? So you don't, you never want to burn trash in a fireplace and you really just want to use um, dry seasoned wood. Um, if you're going to use an artificial fire log, make sure you're using it according to the manufacturer's recommendations and you don't want to use more than one log at a time. Okay, what about the actual starting of a fire in a fireplace? I've heard of people using an accelerant such as kerosene, lighter fluid, charcoal starter fluid. I've even heard of gasoline being used to help get a fire going in the fireplace. Is that something that should be done, and why or why not? No, if you can't, no, that's not a safe choice. That they're not fireplaces aren't designed for. Um, those kinds of starters, um, but they also, there's way too much of a fire risk uh, presenting those along with other uh, fuels in your fireplace. These are such good things to keep in mind and such valuable information. Thank you for sharing with us today, Susan. Thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to Weekend Connection on the Bible Broadcasting Network. This concludes our two-week visit with Susan McKelvey, Communications Manager for the National Fire Protection Association. If you should have any questions regarding what we've been discussing, please visit the National Fire Protection Association's website at nfpa.org. My name is Brent Smith, and we thank you for listening to Weekend Connection on the Bible Broadcasting Network. Thank you for listening to this feature, a production of BBN, the Bible Broadcasting Network.
BBN provides 24-hour Christian programming, great Christian music and Bible teaching. Listen to BBN by clicking the link in the description.